Hello, and welcome to a special edition of All Things Aviation and Aerospace. I'm Vince Mickens with the Private Air Media Group. From time to time, I have the privilege of interviewing an aviation industry icon who has trailblazed her way through an interesting and unique segment of our industry, which has a tendency to fly under the radar or be in the shadows of popularity, I like to say. My guest today, although a total rock star in our world of business and private aviation, who has deftly navigated and chartered her own pathway in the world of in-flight catering and all that goes with it, is a prime example, Paula Kraft. Paula is the founding partner of the Da Vinci In-Flight Training Institute and without question, its fearless, energetic, and inspiring leader. Paula has been in the food business one way or another most of her life. Before Da Vinci, Paula founded Tastefully Yours, which after nearly a half a century is still prospering. How much time do you have? Because I could spend half of the show just reading off Paula's wide array of accomplishments. So if you're watching or listening, get ready to take some notes and learn a lot from one of the, if not the best in business about what it takes to pursue and succeed as an in-flight caterer. Oh, and before I forget, by chance, if you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, yeah, I know, Charlotte, you just happen to be there. Next Monday or Tuesday, Paula, along with other corporate cabin crew member professionals, say that again real fast, will be speaking at the annual Sea Crew Cabin Crew Member Resource Exchange Workshop. More work for me to say that. The Sea Crew Cabin Crew Member Resource Exchange Workshop event. Paula will talk about on such, about such topics as enhancing the in-flight dining experience, preparing meals at 30,000 feet, and much more. For more details, go to ccrew.exchange. That's ccrew.exchange. All right, let's get things started and welcome who I have dubbed as the queen of corporate in-flight catering, Miss Paula Kraft. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely great to have you. I was so impressed with uh, your facility. Uh, to me, it's world class. Uh, I've been to visit a few facilities and yours is definitely one that stands out uh, and is a great representation of our industry in terms of business and private aviation and particularly what you guys offer there, which we're going to we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but but what an amazing place. Uh, well, thank you. I wanted to build something that was equal to the lifestyle a flight attendant has when flying on a private jet. I wanted a facility that would be a teaching experience. We've got white furniture. So now we've got a means we can teach them how to care for white leather on an airplane. So we have things here that resemble or are equal to what is on a jet. So it's all part of the experience in training them. Wow, that's really great. So you're, you're already thinking ahead in terms of mm -hmm. even your facility there. It's like, well, you know, we've got to show them how to do certain things. So why not set this up um, for everything that they're experiencing, even the furniture or where they sit. And, so that's that's pretty neat. Well, the school I founded based on the Montessori style of learning. So I mm. wanted an environment that engaged all your senses and was open to experimentation for people to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. So um, we even our snack bars are set up for a uh, flight attendant to learn how it personally feels to be a passenger that has a request and you go out of your way to do it. So we put a little list up, anything they want during their training week, we provide it for them. So we'll go out and buy a special granola bar or a special beverage that they want because we want them to have the experience to remember that that extra effort, even when they're tired, is making someone feel good. So then they got that emotion that they can attach to going shopping at midnight for somebody. Yeah. Listen, let's talk a minute about your, your background in terms of, let, let me just ask you, where are you originally from? Originally, I was born in New York. 
we moved to Tampa, Florida when I was very young. Okay, and I have then, to interrupt you because yeah. you just can't say New York. What what part of New York were you born? Believe in? it or not, Bronx, Bronxville, New York. Okay. And so um when we moved to Florida, I think I got that southern accent when we moved to Atlanta and I was in, you know, 7 or 8 years old. So I grew up in Atlanta. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. So um, my dad was with an oil company and he had jobs posting all over the world. So we traveled a lot. Our longest stay was in Atlanta. And when they moved, I stayed. So. Okay. But for a while, you were almost like what they call a military brat just in, in the corporate very world. Very close. Very your close. Dad moving all over the place. Right. So. You know, um, there's a lot to cover and talk about, but one of the things that really intrigued me was the aviation lineage that you have in your family, um, it's which is crazy. really interesting because when we talk later about your path and everything, it didn't necessarily follow that, but then, it, then again, it did. Yeah, um, I come from a long line of aviators. I think I'm about the only one in the family without a pilot's license. So um, my father was a pilot. Um, he flew in the Korean War as a navigator and retired as a captain. And then my mother has a sister and she married in and her one of her brothers were both aviators. Um, my mother's um, sister was married to a gentleman who was the first graduating class out of the Air Force Academy in 1959. And then later, after he finished his tour in Vietnam and uh, retired as a colonel, um, he taught at the Air Force Academy and, um, you know, kept that going. But both of his kids got a uh, pilot's license when they were 16. It was just expected in the family. And then my mother had another brother who, as a child, I can remember going to Wichita and it was a silver chrome airplane that had people that just came to look at it. I don't remember what it was, but it was supposedly special. But he loved getting up in the morning and greeting the guys, the pilots at the coffee shop. And, you know, that was his life, polishing his plane and flying with all the fellow guys there. I can and, understand uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I can understand it, you know. Um but then my brother became um, a pilot. He was ROTC and then got into the Air Force. And he was um, a B-52 pilot and he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, but he flew out of the SAC bases. And then when he retired- Air Command. Yeah. yeah. So when he retired from that, um, he went um, up north and he had a very top, top secret job, um, was not allowed to tell anyone what he was working on. And after it was all done, it was part of the desert storm night vision battles where they could watch the camera because he was a physicist with his college degree. So he worked on the development of that night vision uh, battlefield. So. Wow. You know, we never knew. And it was probably right at about the time that he passed away that um, he told us what he did. That's what so, he did. Because we were wow. finding all these awards and stuff. And what is this for? You know, so <laughs> at that point, he did that. And both of his kids are pilots. Um, they each have their own 182. Um, and his wife was a pilot. So they had their matching jets or their matching 182s. And they started a flying club that would plan trips from Boston to Alaska in tandem with each other. So 20, 30 small aircraft, and they would take their time flying from Boston to um, Alaska. And that was yeah. what he did in his retirement. Well, besides being a, an amazing story about an amazing background of aviation everywhere all around you, uh -huh. And it really brings me to ask the question, what happened that you didn't get into it? And I think it's even more interesting that you didn't even initially get into in-flight catering. You you actually got into catering. So that brings me back, I guess, also uh, to talk about where cooking came into play and, and, and you know, the whole chef catering uh -huh. and all of that. Well, I graduated 
from college with a master's in food science and as oh, wow. um, an undergraduate degree in adult and secondary education. So I was going to teach food, cooking, home economics, that sort of thing. And I did for one year and my father actually offered to pay me to leave that job and get another job because I spent all my money on the students that needed help. So he said, you know, you, you can't make a living and give it all away. And I said, but they need it. So at that wow. point, um, I went to Atlanta and I've um, gotten married and my mother-in-law got me at my first job cooking at the church for Wednesday night, um, social, you know, it was a men Wednesday night prayer night. Yeah. And, um, uh, then I s ended up being the director of the wedding program there. And when I was doing that, I was asked if I was interested in doing Macy's food cellar. So I started catering for Macy's Food Cellar. Okay, cakes. Before, yeah. I'm yeah. going to interrupt you for a second. Before okay. you get into the, that aspect of your, uh -huh. your career, I'm go, I want to go back to where did the interest, first of all, you're going to school and already knowing what you wanted to major in. That's pretty uh -huh. unique. <laughs> Talk to so many young people <laughs> that haven't a clue of what they want to do, or they, they just pick a major and then it ends up not being what they thought it was going to be. And then they change. And the, it sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you already had food on the brain, so to speak, um, that cooking was something that you wanted to do. Did that come from your upbringing, from somebody in your family, or was this all Paula? It wasn't all Paula. When we were small, we each had a duty to prepare dinner at night. First duty at the earliest age was setting the table. And then you were allowed to make the salad. And then you were allowed to do vegetables until finally my mother would turn over the meal to you. And I loved doing that. I hated outside work in the yard. And my brother loved that. And my sister loved that. So I ended up getting to do all the cooking. And by the time I was in the ninth grade, um, the school that I was going to, it was the first year of high school. Um, I completed all the home ec classes that the school had to offer. So in the 10th year, um, they said, why don't you write your own curriculum and decide what you want to teach yourself? In because 10th grade? In 10th grade. So 10th, 11th, and 12th <laughs> grade, I wrote my own curriculum and um, knew that I loved food. And food, I was interested in what happened to food. So how did it get processed and how did it, what happens when you reheat? So that was Thus where food the food science. science comes in because I felt like I was more of a scientist understanding food. And I thought I'd work for um, a large food manufacturing company. And I actually did for a while. Um, and I worked in their quality assurance, testing food for viscosity and thickness. And, you know, and that was a lot of fun, but it wasn't challenging. So um, when the offer to do the, the church was only on Wednesday. And then when Macy said, hey, we need a caterer for Penelope Penn, which was their concierge. Um, and we need some one to provide pastries and soups and entrees to the food seller. I said, sure, why not? And um, I did that with Macy's. And my first aviation job was RJR Nabisco moving their headquarters to Atlanta. And they ordered a picnic to be delivered to a concert in the park. And that was the beginning of aviation because every day was a new challenge i wasn't bored anymore i loved it did it feel uh, so with aviation do you think the influence you had growing up with aviation being in the family played a part in that in terms not of not at all not, not at, at all. all it was just the opportunity it was the opportunity that presented itself to me and i actually didn't understand private aviation corporate aviation when I got in when I was asked to do my first tasting at Nabisco I went out with catering in boxes that wouldn't fit through the aircraft door 
So it was one of those things. I expected a Delta size jet. I didn't expect Gulf Streams and Falcons and Hawkers. <laughs> so it, the two women that ran that flight department, one was Linda Galvin, the other Shirley Mancini, they took me under their wing and they taught me everything they knew about aviation catering, portion sizes. Uh, they let me play on the airplanes, you know, and see the, the storage and then the packaging and how things should be presented and uh, what the job of the flight attendant was, you know, when there was a flight attendant on board. And um, they were amazing. And they were the reason that I stayed in aviation because it was so much fun for me to have something different every day. You wake up in the morning and you didn't know what somebody wanted. So it every day was a challenge. And it was one of those, yes, I can do it. You know, I can get it done, you know, um, type attitude. And it just, it grew and grew. And I had mentors um, that involved me with NBAA. And I was invited to go to the first scheduler and dispatcher conference. Um, and that was with Georgia Pacific scheduler. And she says, Paul, you really need to go and get involved. So she took me and introduced me and showed me around and I was overwhelmed. And, you know, it was one mentor after another. So each person directed me in a different way. And my first flight attendant conference that I went to, I think it was either the first or the second one. And they were pretty much sponsored by Rudy's back then. And I went to the conference and Rudy's had paid for it. But there were all these caterers there passing out their menus and marketing themselves on Rudy's dime. And I said, that's not fair. So the next year, I asked NBAA if I could organize all the caterers um, to share the cost. And then everyone would have equal marketing. And mm. so that, that led me into the NBAA flight attendant committee. Right. And I, I served was on- say, there goes your yeah, committee. So I served on that for 15 years and then I, you know, it's kind of like, okay, your time is up. So um, I decided, well, if it's up here, then I'm going to Europe. And I was part of the steering committee to start the flight attendant committee in Europe and get that off the ground and had amazing people to work with um, that supported that. The Anne Sherrard, who was with Gamma at the time, was a big advocate and mentoring and teaching me the European, the way that things were done. And um, then there were people at EBAA that just, everyone just jumped in. They, I guess they felt the energy and people tell me that there's, I have so much energy that they want to touch that energy and get a little bit of <laughs> They want to tap into so, it. Yeah, well, tap into I, it. I so. can attest to that. I've seen you yeah. in action at a number of aviation events. Uh, I, was, I was also going to say that you have an amazing personality. And I think that that, that along with the energy, energy is what well, attracts people to you and, and makes people want to work with you. But you touched on something that, is, that I know is, is dear to your heart. And I, I, now I see why. I think it's twofold because I was raised by educators. So you're wanting to, to do something in education mm -hmm. uh, way back when uh, mm -hmm. says a lot. But when you start talking about mentoring, that is something that I've seen you be very passionate about. And now I know why you are, uh, mm -hmm. because you had a lot of mentors throughout your career that played mm -hmm. key roles in your progressing and in you becoming successful uh, and things like that. Well, and even in the catering side of the industry, I'm mentoring caterers that are new that come in and need help. You know, how do they package this? How do they adjust seasonings and things like that? But they've also mentored me and taught me what they're doing in a different climate, you know, whether it's in Africa or it's in India or in China or in Europe, because they all have different challenges. So they've been educating me and mentoring me, whether they know it or not, because I ask a lot of questions. Well, so. yeah, I can see how that happens, though, because. Um, when I was visiting your facility and you had, you, you guys were doing training, you had some gentlemen from Europe 
one uh -huh. was from Germany and one was from, I think, Italy. And anyhow, um, but the it was the conversation I had with those guys was great because uh -huh. they were all uh, and, and, and I get what you're saying about learning because they were telling me how different an in-flight catering experience and requirements are in Europe flying in mm -hmm. Europe versus here in the in, domestically in the US. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I get that. But I also admire you in the sense that even with all of your background, all of your experience, all of your education, you're like, but I can still learn from somebody. And to say that you can learn from somebody that's just learning the business, uh, that speaks speaks highly of you. Because everybody has a different challenge. So if you understand their challenges, then you can help direct them. Um, I When I started working with John Detloff, the most amazing human, so talented, so yes. much fun. He and I were going back and forth for the first year going, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. And then I go, I didn't know that. Can I, you know, can I claim that? <laughs> you know, so that became a challenge. And now we have um, Rich Barley, who's our new director of uh, culinary, and he's an organic farm to table individual. He lives in the Everglades here and he has his own farm and grows all their food. And so he's bringing a new aspect into culinary to go with the new trends. And I have learned, and he's been here since November. I cannot tell you how many things I've learned that he has taught me that I didn't know about sustainability. Wow. So you know, so that's on your radar. I don't now. think I'll ever get too old to learn. <laughs> At least I, I hope not. You no, know, you and me both. I totally agree with you on that. You know, um, this is a good time for us to kind of start segueing into uh, some of the things that what Da Vinci Flight, In Flight Training Institute is and does and things like that. I wanted to talk about it because you were you were you were talking about it earlier, but I I kind of put the brakes on you for a second because I wanted to mm -hmm. talk more about your the in depth of your background. But when you started uh, um, da Vinci. Your catering. Oh, tastefully so, yours. Tastefully yours. Thank you. When you started yes. tastefully yours, uh, and then that kind of morphed into an opportunity to start Da Vinci. Can you tell us that story? How did that all transpire? Tastefully yours, I founded 45 years ago. Oh, my God. And that was part of when what was going on with Macy's. So at that point, um, I founded Tastefully Yours, and my kids were six and seven at that point, and they were working with me in the kitchen. Back then, our packaging was a cake box with a box lunch in it, so I taught them how to assemble box lunches and the boxes, <laughs> and they'd stack them as tall as they were. And Nothing so like having the, a mom that's a caterer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, in their teen years, it was really amazing because we had so many boys coming by the house um, to see the girls. And then they'd go to the kitchen and they'd wash dishes and do whatever needed to be done so the girls could go out on dates. So okay. I got a lot of free help in the kitchen. And they could you get know. fed. And then they did get <laughs> fed. Um, so it was kind of fun. And several of them ended up opening restaurants and catering companies, you know, no after kidding. having been doing that with us. Just so being exposed you know, to you doing that. Yeah. And I had one pilot one time. Yeah. That when I had taste was doing tastefully yours, my daughter and her husband are taking it and running with it now. Um, but I had a pilot who told me he had a son that was a problem and he liked to cook. And would I hire him and teach him how to cook and straighten him up and use the mother's touch on him. And he ended up becoming a pilot and the son did. And then he decided he'd rather be an AMP mechanic and a chef on the side. So he's, he's doing wow. that. And he still calls me mom because I treated him like a son and scolded him and when he needed it and gave him praise when he deserved it. So, wow. yeah. So tastefully yours became a family business um, with the two girls and then extended family with all their boyfriends and their cheerleading friends and anybody that wanted to knew they could come by the kitchen and there would be food for them. Right. And uh, we ended up, I had, 
told my daughters, you cannot marry anybody in the industry because it's hard. It's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day as a caterer, you're on call. Um, as soon as you make a personal plan to have a family dinner, I sold my Christmas dinner one year to a client that was leaving town and we were closed. And she said, oh my gosh, I have to have food. And I said, I have what's on my table for dinner. And she said, I'll take it. Oh my and gosh. So my, my kids still to this day remind me of that. No mom. Oh, I'm yeah. sure they do. <laughs> yeah. You sold our Christmas dinner out from under us. But um, talk about talk about customer service. Yeah, you can have what we're eating. We ate soup. But anyway, so with that, um, they both ended up marrying pilots. And um, we've got my I have one son in law who is a uh, line service manager for one of the FBOs. And um he called me and said, please, please let me date your daughter. And I said, nope, they're not allowed to date. And he wouldn't give up. So finally I said, all right, you can go out one day. They went to a baseball game and fell in love and ended history. up getting married, <laughs> you know. And they're the two nice. that are running Tastefully Yours now. Because it turns really? out he has a passion for cooking. Oh, so wow. he left the FBO. He was with Bell South for a while, A&B Group. Um, and then the FBOs, but, uh, he's left them all and is full-time a hot chef at Tastefully Yours. And, mm. uh, he's a great big teddy bear and he just loves what he does and he's passionate about it. And, um, you know, and Amanda does, she is my old or my youngest daughter. She manages all three businesses, Airwear, Tastefully Yours and Da Vinci. Um, okay. so she's doing that. And then, um, you know, my oldest daughter is very, very active. She was a elementary school teacher, um, because she couldn't take the schedule and the routine for aviation and she wanted to work with kids. So I said, I get that, you know, So that, that brings me to a point where of something that I really, um, mm -hmm. would love to hear what you have to say about it. And that is, you, you brought up that people that discover that they have a passion for something, um, in this case, cooking. And, and one of the things that I try to do with this show is tell young people in particular, or somebody that's a, a, an aspiring young aviation professional that's maybe uh, still in school or just coming out of school, is that whatever it is that you, you do, whatever your skill set is, I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. it can be applicable to just about anything in aviation. And so Absolutely. I, I'm more specific to you. Yeah, and, and you gave one great example of talking about somebody, pilot, A&P, and cooks on the side. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of young potential chefs out there, or, or, or cooks, people that really know how to cook and love cooking, and probably have never thought about that they could do something like in flight catering that they we're could kind work. of a, a hidden industry yes so um exactly and i'm very excited uh to be now connected with several universities and school systems that have culinary programs um and to be able to go and teach aviation cooking so the seasoning changes that you have to make to adjust for altitude, the importance of colors and textures and how to Back keep to your food science. Yes. <laughs> so and it, it did. It all rolled around and all the different things I've done. I was a food stylist for magazines and TV for 20 years while I was catering. And the techniques that I learned from photographers, I'm teaching now in the culinary classes for the students to learn how to photograph the food they're preparing, because there's nothing worse now when they ask, are asked for a portfolio to have a snapshot that you don't see any definition in the food. So part of what I do is I show them how to use their camera and their different lighting on the their cell phone to photograph so their portfolios will be better when they're doing a job search. So it's, Everything seems to have ended up in Da Vinci, you know, yeah. all of the yeah. the different things that I've got. And I'm very, very excited um, to be part of the 
um, school system out of Manatee County and going in and working with um, their students in their tech program. And um, we've also been offered to do internships for um, GEDs and technical um, school, having them work at Da Vinci um, to prepare catering orders or at Tastefully Yours so that they know how to do the job because there's so many companies that are desperate to find somebody that is passionate and knows aviation. So it, it takes a long time to retrain a chef that's not got any aviation knowledge or skill to sure. be a really amazing chef for an aircraft. Well, and you make a great point because there's altitude consideration. There's cultural uh, consideration, um, mm -hmm. depending on the country and things like that. Um, and then there's the prep and the, and, and the, well, listen to me telling you, but anyhow. Mm -hmm. No, nope, and you're things. exactly right. You're exactly <laughs> uh, right. But all of those things, I, so I, uh, I've been to a couple of your education sessions uh -huh. and, you know, I do that pop in for a little bit and then move on to, to check out something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got stuck in yours <laughs> because I was like, <laughs> wow, this is fascinating. Just looking at how you and and some of your staff were teaching, um, you know, the up and coming or corporate flight attendants that want to know a little bit more of, to expand their ability on their job to know about things like catering, catering and, and, and that type mm -hmm. of thing. And it was it was very fascinating to see all of that take place. Um, but to your point, I think it's also really great that someone like you and, and like Da Vinci can offer uh, this kind of training to to the, the next, you know, great caterer or in-flight caterer and things like mm -hmm. that and give them that aviation experience. I didn't want to jump all around, but because you brought it up, I'm going to jump to Da Vinci for a minute because one of the things that really I loved was, you know, I'm a pilot, so simulators are one thing, flight simulators. But seeing a cabin simulator, which is what I'll call it, you may have another name. Yeah, for it. I was we like, call well, it a, the cool. open concept. Yeah, yeah. So you have two of them there at the school mm -hmm. uh, for two different kinds of aircraft, and I just thought, well, you know that that's as real of an environment as you can give without actually being on an aircraft itself. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. Well, that's one of my Montessori things that I've brought in. I want their training where they actually learn to prepare and serve a meal in the confines of an aircraft galley. So our legacy is a very small galley. And when we go through initial training, we put them in there to prepare meals and serve their classmates. So everybody prepares and serves. And then how do you clean up? How do you keep organized? What's your time management? So everything comes out at the right time. And then the open concept, we do uh, table service. And I think the biggest shock for me on that part of the training was flight attendants that have been flying for 20, 25 years, 10 years, didn't really understand how to set a table properly. You know, where the silverware goes or where the glassware goes or why you put the salt and pepper shakers to the right and, or in the center, you know, what pieces of utensils are needed and glassware and clearing it, open hand service, uh, the use when they're doing table linens, a multan, which is uh, like a pillowcase that you slide over a tray table that, or not a tray table, but a, a side table. And the tablecloth is laid on top of this pillowcase. And then you remove it with ever having any crumbs or dust getting on the carpet because we teach them is how important it is to protect the passenger's asset. This is their investment and damage to the carpet, to the tables, you know, putting a hot glass or bowl down without any precaution. So they're learning all of that in that table service routine. And then we have mock service where they prepare a meal for their flight, which may have five to eight people that they have to prepare a meal, uh, plate it, serve it, and make sure that it goes out hot. 
So there's a lot of food that goes through. We prepare about 40 different recipes in the culinary elite class every week and they have to plate them all. So um, it gives them a lot of experience in handling that environment. Now in the new facility, we also use the um, Embraer for smoke training and CPR training so that they have to get down in the environment. What happens if you can't get the passenger out of the seat? How do you do CPR or um, first aid to a passenger that's sitting? And how do you lay them back? How do you get them out of the seat and onto the floor? And it's in an environment that is similar to and generally smaller than what they'll actually have. So, and it's a lot of fun and we scream and we yell and we holler all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> and I love it. I get to role play every once in a while and I get to be a nervous passenger and I'll blow my life vest up in the cabin instead of waiting. And I want to carry my <laughs> dog with me and let me take pictures. I want to put this on, you know, YouTube and just to come up with a whole bunch of fun things that, in the panic. It shows them that, you know, you might not have really easy passengers to work with because I love being a challenge. So well, you you have built this uh, into something that's pretty amazing. I have to look at my notes here, but um, the, uh, some of the classes that I see that you offer and training, I should say that so you offer because you mm -hmm. offer different different levels, aviation security, uh, online oh. training, uh, partner specialty. I'll be curious to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, commercial to corporate, I actually know a couple of flight attendants that are in transition to go from mm -hmm. a commercial to corporate. Uh, service elite training, you were just talking about that a bit. Uh, Somalia, uh, mm -hmm. lead flight attendant leadership course. Uh, the Butler course, that's one of your newer ones, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. a British Butler Institute the, training. And that class, we just released it and it is almost sold out. Just that quickly. There's that quick. Just like, well, our culinary classes um, through the summer sold out until September. But that to have a brand new class sell out that fast, you know, with a waiting list, it's Im impressive for me. I just think, wow. But I think we partnered with um, a good company that is familiar. The course is designed just for aviation. So it's geared to the environment, to things that happen, what happens to wine, your taste of wine at altitude, pressurization, that sort of stuff. Um, the culinary elite, it's everything from the basics, working with um, placing an order, planning menus, um, working with your caterer. How do you get what you order from a caterer? you've got to learn to speak the language. So we go through how to place an order and how are you going to reheat? What kind of packaging will you need? What'll be leak proof, that sort of stuff to lots and lots of plating and lots and lots of eating. Um, and everything, the recipes that we adapt, we adapt them for the aircraft. So um, we do a panna cotta in the microwave. So it's something that can be done on board in a hurry and ready in 30 minutes by chilling it in your Gasper drawer. And yeah. it's made with sugar packets and a thing of creamer. So where did this come from in terms of Da Vinci? How did it come about? Well, I retired from Tastefully Yours. And I wasn't ready to stop. So I had oh, had surprise. so I know <laughs> I had had uh, so many companies and uh, groups that asked me to come and teach classes at their facility mm. and a lot of food safety classes. Um, and with that, I thought, you know, I was doing it for free at Tastefully Yours before I retired. And I loved showing them new things. Let's get out of the rut on a crudité. Let's change the way we do this. So I always wanted to inject something new. And my personal feeling was that flight attendants, and forgive me, because um, I say what's on my mind, were looked at in a lot of cases like a hooker in heels. 
Mm. And they wanted somebody that's gorgeous and sexy and beautiful, you know, to be going up and down the aisle and to be serving their guests. But really, these are professionals and they weren't Absolutely. looked at as a professional. So Da Vinci's main goal was that I wanted to create a career professional that was doing something that was more than going coffee, tea, or me. I wanted to give them the skills that they would feel on equal level to a pilot or an AMP or a flight tech, that they had had proper training to be a professional. It wasn't something that you just kind of showed up. And believe me, in my early years, I'd have people come to me and say, the owner met this girl and he wants her to be his flight attendant tomorrow. Can you train her? And, mm. you know, it wasn't, they weren't getting the training they needed to do their job. And I tell the flight attendants here, you're the ones that'll probably be the one pulling the pilot out in an accident. You're the one that's going to get the passengers out safely. You're the one that's going to make sure the food they have is safe to eat and has been handled correctly and reheated correctly and that you've prevented cross-contamination. And the galley is the worst place in the world to try to do that. But if they have the proper training, they're more than just a pretty face in the back. They are truly a very valuable asset. Um, I personally think that a flight attendant should be on every flight um, just for safety, if nothing else. Sure. Sure, um, absolutely. You know, they're the ones that are going to prevent a passenger from putting something metal in a microwave or leaving something with a paper lid up in the oven if they were heating something and have a, a fire on board. They're the ones that are going to see the passengers in medical distress and go to their rescue. That's a profession. That's not just a job. And so as a, Vin as a, yeah. yeah, I was going to say as a testament to what you're talking about, there was a crash about a month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew the, the flight, flight attendant. attendant. Yeah. Yeah. Was the one that saved everybody because she knew exactly what to do and how to do it. Well, and it's funny because uh, there are several people that I know that have been talking with her since that accident. And she has commented that the passengers, she got in the back of the cabin because she knew there was going to be an emergency and that the passengers then had to pull their cell phones out to light the exit door enough that they could see through the smoke to find it, the handle to remove that door. And I know since that accident, there are several large companies and fractionals that now have that in their training. It was not an approved exit because of the height from the ground. But in the event that you have no other exit out, it has now become um, something that and flight alternate attendants exit, are being trained on, yeah. which, sure. you know, I think she made a huge, huge change for the industry and opened people's eyes to the, the need of uh, a cabin attendant and yeah, not and just somebody serving that is safety trained. So sorry, and the importance I get off of my all, box. Yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> and the importance of all that you guys do there and why you do it um, and how it affects people. Um, Quick, because uh, I have a couple other things and we're going okay. to run out of time in a bit. But uh, in terms of your facilities there, tell us a little bit more about it. We we, we talked about what the cabin um, simulators, I call them. You, mm -hmm. What was what's the name you called them? Uh, open concept is the okay. one that you sit outside. You can watch what's going on inside. Gotcha. And then the legacy is the Embraer that's the closed concept. Um, and Embraer actually gave that to me. It was sitting on a ramp in Melbourne. They said, if you want it, you got to get it out of here. And I called a couple pilots I knew who knew aircraft choppers. And I had that thing towed to Florida or down here to Fort Lauderdale the next day. So uh, it took me three years to get enough money to fix it. But um, it's up and running and we love it. So 
Yeah. And and then you have silverware, diningware. Um, you have um, um, the classrooms where you can mm -hmm. teach actual uh, techniques for cooking and uh, things like right. that. You, you, so we have the culinary lab. Yeah, we have a culinary, culinary lab. lab. There you go. And I call it a lab because aviation catering is a science. It's not as much the traditional method of cooking. It's got more to it. When you package something, you have to consider pressurization. So what is going to explode? What's going to pop? What will travel well and be handled and shuffled around without um, breaking, leaking, you know, that sort of stuff, because then you have cross-contamination issues. So we do a lot of cooking in there, uh, plating, um, as well as how to work with a caterer. The, we have a classroom for the service. And in there, we do how to serve um, teas from Asian tea services to Arabic tea service and coffee service. And we have the equipment. Um, we're training on fine china. And we're training with high quality silver, silver plate, because they have to learn what it feels like. And I know that that sounds kind of crazy, but there is a feel that you literally can learn by touching a quality piece of porcelain or china. And you know that your owner paid a lot of money for that. So by knowing how something feels and the quality, you're not going to slam it in a dishwasher. You're going to take better care and handle it differently. So how do you handle the glassware that is your very expensive crystal? We teach them what it feels like. So I can identify the difference between a Libby glass by the way it feels and even the rim that's on the top to a good crystal and the good quality things. I mean, everything has to be cared for, but there's certain techniques. And we did a, a training in the service class this weekend, how to clean the silver. Flight attendants don't realize that the silverware and the trays need to be cleaned, but there's a technique that it doesn't take any time and it's not messy. So we're teaching that and we'll put that out as a video for everybody to see, but it's baking soda and boiling water. Wow. So, um, and it just comes off, but it doesn't destroy the silver or the plate like Tarnex would. So we show them what to do and what not to do, and then how to take care of those assets. Um, Airware was started actually by my daughter, Amanda, and her husband, Eric, um, in reaction to people asking us, where do I get this? And she started the business with packaging for caterers. And then flight attendants would say, hey, can you get me one of these? I broke one of this. We need to replace that. So she started the airware with the fine china and crystal. And that's what we use for our training now. So that way you can touch it and we go on a tour. And I think you can see it over here on this side. Um, and I encourage the students, don't be afraid to pick it up. I want you to hold it. I want your hands to touch it. I want you to feel the sensation that you get from holding a piece of stainless versus a piece of silver, because there's a big difference in the way you take care of them. You can't mix stainless and silver in a dishwasher. They'll turn black. They just, those two metals don't go together. So sure. it's those sort of things that we're trying to teach so that they are a better person in taking care of the asset. Yeah. Um, and I think that's critical. So, Paula, before the show, we were talking about um, advising and or providing advice and inspiring the up and coming generation as it relates to in-flight catering and this aspect of the industry. You mentioned earlier in the show that uh, it's kind of almost a hidden industry. You don't really hear it's in the shadows, so mm -hmm. to speak. I couldn't agree with you more about that, which is one of the reasons I've done a couple of shows about it. Um, uh, it's a, it is an exciting industry, which you expressed earlier too. You've had an opportunity to go around and, 
and educate uh, young people uh, and people in the industry about the type of things that they should know and, and the opportunities that are there uh, and things like that. You've done it from your, um, from your company, you've done it on your own, et cetera, and so forth. I guess what I'd like to do with the, the last uh, six or seven minutes we have for the show is talk about one of the things that you touched on, which is, you know, what, what are the, what's the advice that you give to young people that are interested in something like this? You mentioned earlier, it's a 24 mm seven, -hmm. 365 days a year on call type of a, sounds like a pilot's job too. Bob. Yeah, it is. It's an aviation job. It's an aviation job. Talk yeah. about that a little bit and, and what you're, you know, if you if you're sitting in front of some high school or college students, what you would be telling them? Well, first and foremost, it's all about the passion. Love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. Love what you do and the money will follow. You may not be rich, but you'll be rich in the passion and the energy that you've got. So it's not money that's going to make you happy and feel good. It's the feeling that you get about doing your passion every day. Um, that's my the main goal. But in the industry, there's such a huge change going on with, um, I'd call it the older regime retiring. And we've got this new wave of flight attendants and flight techs that are coming in that have grown up in the technology era. They've grown up in the uh, era where you can go on Google and have something done and you get your food delivered and um, all you do is make a phone call or go to an app. But what they forget is they're going and they want things in an instant. Most of the time, and I'd say 99% of the time, the quality doesn't happen in an instant. So the flight attendants, if they're ordering because it's easier or because they think that they don't have enough time, and that's time management, um, to plate something, they'll order 15 passengers and they've got um, three legs. They'll order 15 pre-plated snack plates for each leg. So now you have 45 plates that they have to store, but they don't have to do anything but unwrap them and put them out. But they've never learned by doing that how to plate in the event that that doesn't happen. So they're skipping steps to build experience to help them get through things that aren't happening. One of the biggest things that I see, and I warn all the flight attendants, there's there are unwritten rules in the industry. At least there have been in the time I've been here. And sure. that is, you don't photograph the interior of your owner's aircraft. That's like photographing someone's living room or bedroom. Right. But yet they do it and they post it on social media. They want to tell me who their passengers are because they think as a caterer, they'll get better service. But if you're flying on a private jet, the caterers in the industry know they are all important people. So you can't think that if you've got a V, 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 VIP, that they're going to have anything different than the VIP because they're all in that category. So they're violating the security of that person, but no one's teaching them. You do not share your passengers, your destination. Caterer doesn't need to know. Flight length, that would be good because then they can help coordinate portion size or what to will work in that time frame, but they're sharing so much information that hmm. the security of the passengers is being breached in my opinion. So, um, you know, we've got a lot more food allergies, but you know, the caters are here to help and to help get them through all those allergies, but is it an allergy or is it an intolerance? Big difference in what happens in the kitchen if it's an intolerance versus oral dislike versus an allergy that would cause an anaphylactic shock. So they don't understand the relationship between the two. Sure. Um, 
So, you know, I could yeah. just I go on and on. So I, I, I'm sorry. No, no problem. We're just, I, I wanted to get two more things in real quick. Okay. I wanted to ask you if you could briefly, what's your number one piece of advice for someone that's maybe a commercial flight attendant with the airlines and are wanting to become a corporate flight attendant and, and be a thorough one in terms of their professionalism and ability and things like that. What's the number one piece of advice you would give them? Number one piece of advice is for them to ask themselves, am I a servant? And I don't mean that in a negative connotation, but is it my soul and my mission to be serving people? Or am I doing this for a job? A good flight attendant in the private jet industry is a server. Um, they're a servant. They're, they're working to make the trip pleasurable for every single person on board. And if you don't have that mentality that I'm here to make their day, I'm here to do for them rather than, oh, I'm so tired and I don't want to stand and I don't want to do this and I don't want to go shopping after hours, then they won't be successful. They'll be unhappy in the job. So that if they feel that they're meant to serve, um, you know, and it's the same. I'm for me, I feel like, you know, I'm to serve the Lord. Well, I'm to serve the people as well. So it's the same type of feeling. Sure. So. And, and to close things out, for a young person in middle high school, maybe they're in college, but the younger person that really loves cooking is a really good cook. Maybe they learn from their their mom and dad or mm -hmm. grandparents or whatever the case may be, but they just love cooking. And all of a sudden they hear, oh, I could do in-flight catering. What's the what's the one piece of advice you would give them uh, to start pursuing a career in this area? Super easy. Go to a kitchen and offer to wash dishes. As crazy as that sounds, they'll get a job washing dishes. But in the meantime, the chefs and the cooks in the kitchen will start teaching them what they need to know. And within a year, six months, depending on how much they want to learn, they'll learn it. And then they got paid doing it. So then they can take it to the next level. But just go to an aviation caterer, check the FBOs at the airport, get all the aviation caterers in that city near where they are um, and go knock on the door and say, can I wash dishes? <laughs> yeah, I can't no. tell you how many of my dishwashers at Tastefully Yours have become sous chefs in our kitchen. Yeah, well, and you're talking about paying your dues bottom line yeah. Uh, yeah that's something that kind of resonates sometimes with this generation this new yeah, not very often and yes exactly <laughs> i'm trying to be nice about it but it, it just it doesn't it doesn't always register with them but point taken and you know you're saying really learn every aspect of it which is, i've heard more than once in just about every and i i feel that way too learn every aspect of whatever it is that you're interested in because the more you mm -hmm. know the more you'll you'll the better you'll do, the more you'll grow, the opportunities that will open up for you and things like that. Mm -hmm. so. And I will um say in the end, Joe D'Amato, sure. who is with NBAA, sure. created mm -hmm. a video for careers in aviation. And it's open for viewing in schools, aviation clubs, um, science museums. You know, wherever they're having kids and have aviation programs, aviation clubs, um, middle school, elementary school, um, any of that, it's free. And I don't think NBAA, last I heard, was not charging for it, but it's a great way to get something else in that career field. So it shows how many hundreds and hundreds of jobs there are. Yeah, I believe, I, I think it's uh, it's accessible, even if you're not a member, although they have uh, junior memberships that are available there too mm -hmm. for NBAA. For those who don't know, the National Business Aviation Association. Uh, any closing thoughts as we as we wrap this up? I just want to thank you for letting me tell you all about my passion and what I love to do, and giving me the opportunity to share. Well, so. it's been an absolute honor and, and pleasure and privilege to have you 
uh, one on one to to talk about your career, your background, which is even more extensive than I knew, even with my research. I was <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> um, and and just and and the the tie in with aviation uh, and the success of Da Vinci. It's it's really been a pleasure to uh, to talk with you about it. So thank you very much for thank for you being on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, that about wraps things up for all things aviation and aerospace. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have uh, uh, Paula Kraft, uh, again, the uh, founding partner for DaVinci In-Flight Training Institute. Uh, and before that, which I didn't know for 40 years <laughs> of, <laughs> of Tastefully Yours Catering um, and, and all the other things that she's done. Uh, it's been, been a great conversation. I hope that you as an audience uh, learned some things from it. I know I did. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys again. Uh, All Things Aviation and Aerospace is a production of Private Air Media Group. Uh, it is available uh, on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. It will also be available as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from. And until next time, uh, thanks for joining us and take care. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, Paula. Bye. <laughs>